I'm hoping I can get Dirt Perfect here to show me this fancy power washer here. PTO driven with that little 655. Maybe when he gets back out of here, we can get him to wash Vinny. I'm, I'm kind of Tom Sawyer. You know, you would really enjoy washing my Vinny. So, uh, I guess I do need to return the favor since you did mow the majority of my pond dam. <laughs> I got stuck first thing. This is true, this is true. The 955 did come to the rescue. <laughs> if you missed that video, go it's check it out. It's worth watching. It's, <laughs> that's a heck of an introduction to a new machine there, Tim. Yeah. Uh, uh, straight down the hill in the <laughs> ditch. 60 feet, you said. I think that's about yeah, it. Yeah, it, it's pretty close. So, <laughs> since we got this thing dirty, we can't send it home that way. Right. And I think I have just the tool you've been eyeballing. Yeah, I've been seeing this. I've never seen anything like this. This is, uh, as we hit on in an earlier video, this is a homemade contraption. And as you guys can probably tell, I haven't spent a dime on this thing. <laughs> it is a PTO driven power Johnny washer. A Johnny Cash rig. It, uh, one piece at a time. One it didn't piece cost at a me time a dime. It's the exact same. So I use this thing a lot. I think you have your doubts about how well it works. There's only one way to find out. I'm gonna right? point it right at Christy. <laughs> the finance the committee will have 75 you. gallons, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Unbelievable. Approximately 2,800 PSI. You ready? Rah, rah, rah. This is a real deal. It's like magic. Take it on the job site. We load it up all the time. We have breakdowns break break down on the job. It goes right on the tilt deck trailer. Fill it up with water, take it to the job site. Clean off what we need to, haul it back. Necessity is another invention. It, uh, it was built because I had a pile of parts, but it's one of the handiest inventions I ever, the handiest contraptions I've ever built. I think you could sell it. You need to go into business. See the patent at first? Probably a little late for that. We just showed it publicly. <laughs> I mean, it's got the power. It does. It's... I hate washing tires. You'll never get it all. No. Amazing. So what are you thinking for a pile of parts, Tim? I wonder how much it would cost to build one of these new. So if I was gonna build this thing from scratch, I think one major difference I would make is not have it trailer mounted. Three point hitch three mount. Point. But I think you're gonna have to be a little bit cautious of the amount of water you carry on the three point hitch due to weight. Yeah, I've got but, a 60 gallon. I don't think I'd have a 95. No, I, I might be able to hold 90. Even with 60 gallon, I think you'll be spraying for every bit of a half an hour. Yeah. But, uh, it has proved to be one very handy tool over the years. And you could potentially do the pump directly on, well, I don't know, you had to change the speed. Yeah, that was kind of the beauty of using the uh, sickle bar mower and doing a little bit of math, kind of knowing what RPM I needed. I honestly run the tractor at a little higher RPM than I'd like to, but I need to do that to uh, obtain pump speed. You know, when it comes time to wash the machines, I'm not so much worried about getting every speck of dirt off of it and Correct. making it like it's you know showroom ready, but I think it really is part of good maintenance to keep it to keep it washed. My biggest concern is places that are going to hold moisture on a mower like this. If you've got wet grass on the deck down around the pulleys and the shivs, that's going to hold moisture and it's going to promote corrosion. So get that stuff out of there. Same thing with mud and our undercarriages on our dozer. We normally use this for repairs. We got something that needs to go down to try to clean it up the best we can yep. before we get in there to get in there to work on it, which makes this rig so nice is we just load it on the trailer, take it to the job site and it's good to go. Uh, I know a lot of other companies make like a pallet based with its own engine on it, but a lot of times they don't get used enough. And you're sitting there working on the engine trying to get it to go. Before I you, hate before, having another engine. Before you take it out there with this you thing would think here. either this or a, a hydraulic skid steer driven one would be a, it'd be Yeah, this, this here, engine. the only maintenance I've had on this over the last several years is putting winter antifreeze in it. 
uh, whenever the whenever the season comes. I'm glad you went there. What do you do to wash stuff in the winter? I mean, you still work in the winter. Uh, yeah, I got the hot seat tank, um, steam cleaner. Everybody's got a different name for them. I don't wash my stuff on a regular basis. It usually gets shoveled and blowed off with a leaf blower unless it needs to be worked on or in the shop. Uh, at that point, I'll uh, hook up the steam cleaner in the win winter time, clean what I need to clean, and, and, and go from there. Fascinating. I, I love this piece of equipment. If you need a business idea, I think there's possibility here. It's, it's not much to look at, but it's definitely functional. <laughs> Mike, we were involved in a meet and greet a few weeks ago together, and uh, one of the questions that got asked was, how do you start your own business. And I, I assume this particular guy was asking in the terms of either a landscape style business, something more like uh, the, the equipment that we would have, or a big excavator business like something you'd have. So I thought it might be useful for us to just talk about this a little bit. Yeah, that's probably one of the more frequently asked questions I get on my channel is how do I get, how do I get started? I always like to uh, put a little disclaimer on that because what worked for you or I may not work for everybody. Exactly. So. Everybody has different rules, different regulations, different competition. So yeah. uh, as we give advice here, I just want to kind of make sure we use it how it applies to your situation. But what we can do is share our stories and our experiences of how we got how we got where we're at. And for me, it all started with this tractor right here. This little 655 right here. Little 655. It's got a very special place in my heart. Um, it's only a 16 horse subcompact tractor. Uh, my grandparents bought it whenever I was about 12 years old, and immediately from there, I went into business for myself. I didn't know it at the time, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of business did you do? The, the normal stuff you do with a tractor like this. I had a 54-inch grader blade on the back of it. Okay. I thought I was the best there was in the neighborhood. I was, was. I was, by technicality, because I was the only guy in the uh -huh. neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in the beginning, it was simple stuff. Somebody would have a stump ground. You'd go in and clean that up. It would rain, somebody's driveway needs graded, you go in and clean that up. And then while you're there, you sell yourself. Hey, who's mowing your yard? Who's, who's doing this? Who's doing that? And one thing kind of leads to the other. And by the time I was 15, I don't know for sure, I probably had about six or seven mowing contracts, a few of them commercial. Um, I had 10 or 15 customers. I did regular driveway maintenance for them. All with this tractor? All with this tractor right here. I lived in a small town. I didn't have a license, I didn't have a pickup truck. I probably got 20,000 miles on this tractor rolling it around. <laughs> so you just, you just with the tractor, you had a little trailer or something and you just... Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a fun little fact, I actually have got a speeding ticket on this tractor doing 32 mile an hour. <laughs> Tell us a little more about that. You can't leave us hanging. So <laughs> uh, the town we grew up in was Troy. There was a, a, a hill they called Fulton Hill. We'd go mowing yeah. up there. And I figured out that whenever you come off the hill, instead of doing the 12 mile an hour, it would do, you just kick that puppy in neutral and down the hill you'd go. Well, they chip and sealed the road right there before you get to the stop sign. Yeah. And I wasn't stopping at the stop sign. And the town marshal lived just right there. And I think he clocked me at 31 going through the intersection. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. He lit you up, huh? That wasn't my brightest moment on the little track. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for a good story 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to laugh about now. So when did you buy your first attachment? So I didn't buy attachments. I couldn't afford them. I built them. Okay. Um, I built all kinds of different attachments. One of them is the trailer sitting over here. Uh, I built a greater blade. I built a plow. I built a snow pusher. Uh, I built a lot of different things. I love tinkering. It was kind of my, my hobby whenever I didn't need stuff. So if I had a job coming up or if I had a task I knew I thought I could make money at, I went to the scrap pile and see what I could retrofit and, and put on there. It was kind of, I was fortunate enough I had access to this through the family but I wasn't getting any attachments. If I wanted them, I had to build them. So um, I did have a John Deere grader blade that I ended up retrofitting into a few other things. And, and, and I'm not sure what it ended life was as it was, but it wasn't a grader blade no more. But everything else, um, with the exception of, is I did end up getting enough money, I did buy a four foot brush hog for this at one time that I used. Okay. That was the okay. one attachment I did end up buying, but everything else I, uh, I built, so. So you didn't reinvest a lot of the money early on that you made on your, your, your jobs. You I did, it. but not in the business. <laughs> now you, you invested it in the young ladies and stuff. Four wheelers and, and other stuff. Yeah. They, they, they didn't have a return on investment. That's, that's terminology you learn later in life is a return on investment. So you made some mistakes along the way. I did, I did, uh, but, 
the lessons I learned with this little tractor on small scale, I still apply today on a much larger scale. Customer relations being a big one. You know, you, you grade the first driveway for the little old lady or, or whoever it is, you think you did the best job in the world, and then she calls and she's not happy because you got rocks in her yard. Well, guess you what? You didn't realize it was important. I didn't realize it was important. But me going back and saying, I'm sorry, let me rake those back out of your yard. Well, guess what? Now she's over having coffee with her neighbor and she's bragging about me instead of complaining so about me. So you made a mistake, and that mistake and how you handled it got the neighbor's business. Exactly. Exactly. It's a, a key point to learn. I've, I've experienced the same thing. It's not how you do the job necessarily the first time. It's how you take care of the customer. In full disclosure, in the beginning, I had very low overhead and I reinvested very little. So I was working for play money, is right. to be honest. Um, as I graduated away from this tractor, this was my middle school, high school thing. And so your business kind of, kind of in a sense, stopped at the end of high school, right? I was still mowing a few yards and I still had some snow contracts that I performed with this. But obviously as I went through high school and college, time got very limited. I always knew I could fall back on this little thing if I ever needed to. Okay, so let's talk about that. You didn't go straight from high school to, to you know, the big excavating uh, role that you have now. Um, you actually took a turn. You actually went to college. I did. I went to a two-year vocational school. I got a degree in applied science. And uh, from there, I went to work at a Mack truck dealership. I actually worked as an assistant service manager for about two and a half years. Okay. One thing you cannot teach in school is experience. Uh, the experience I got working at Mack was invaluable to this day. Okay. Um, it was a miserable time working there. But what I learned while I was there, I, I apply every day of my life. So forward. would you say that that's the personal skills that you learned there, or did you learn some technical things as well? Both. W w equally. Uh, Mac had an awesome training program at the time. I uh, called it Mac University. I was able to participate in a bunch of those, uh, which is a lot of technical stuff. And then whenever you're 21 years old and you got close to 70 guys working for you, you learn some personal and some management skills really quickly. Uh, and, and I wasn't perfect. I made mistakes. I screwed stuff up, but I was always able to apply that to the next situation and learn from it. And had a very, very good relationship with, with all the people that worked for me whenever I left there. Uh, it's like a lot of things in life. You, you, the time you're living it, you don't realize, you don't appreciate what you're gathering. And then you get older and you're like, wow, I wish I would have soaked a little bit of that more up while I was, yeah, soaked that yeah. up a little more while I was Makes in the situation. Sense. But, uh, but I, I would not change my route in that at all. I mean, that was a very, very good experience for me. But even though you, you spent two years at college uh, studying some, some diesel technology, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so you were, you were still learning things. Well, I mean, you can say it, I was a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went to be a mechanic and you ended up in management pretty quick there. Pretty quickly. Yeah, I made it as a mechanic for two weeks. But even during all... <laughs> I, I did it for two you weeks. You thought then. you were getting fired. So I did. Me. I did. I worked there as a night shift oil change mechanic and they called me into the office and I thought, man, how did I screw this up already? <laughs> man. And uh, long story short, I, I got promoted to being in the office and, and it, it was a good experience. So. You had two years of college and then that for two and a half years, but you never lost the passion for maybe having your no, own No, the whole time, the whole time I was in college, the whole time I was working at the dealership, I was still dabbling with this in the background. Uh, the ultimate goal was still to have an excavating business. Uh, I just knew that it wasn't the right time to do it at that time, which was 2002, 2003 in there. But uh, yeah, I was still mowing yards. I was still grading driveways. I was still brush hogging. Um, all that stuff was still happening in the background. So it might look like that your business was totally dead and you really hadn't invested anything at that point. So tell us about when you really decided to restart and get serious about this for a career. So I went back, as I left the Mack truck dealership, I went back to work for a contractor here in town. And the whole purpose of that was to position myself to where I could kind of transition out, which is, is kind of what I did. And it's one of those things is you start picking up side work and side work and side work and eventually you get to the point where the side work's the main thing. And it's kind of like uh, ripping off a band-aid. It's kind of sink or swim or, or just get it over with. I got married and, and went full time all at the same time. That's uh, left for my honeymoon and never, never went back to the real job. But not with the old 655. No, at this point I was still using the 655. I did buy a U35 Kubota excavator. Okay. 
So a three and a half ton excavator. Three Boy, that's half, big time. Yeah, that's that was a twenty six thousand dollar purchase, and I might as well have bought a twenty six million dollar machine. I it mean, was just was, more than you could imagine yeah. getting paid off at the time. Uh, I had a pickup truck and a gooseneck trailer, and I would take that machine out to dig footers or do whatever small jobs that machine would do. But nine times out of ten, this tractor went with it. A lot of times I'd use the little dump trailer over there and haul my dirt off and dump it in the corner. Or I'd put the box blade or the grader blade on this thing and clean up behind me. And they fit well on the trailer together and, and this was still an intricate part of what we were doing. Uh, and I probably ran that set up for a year and a half or two years, uh, kind of doing what I could. Now, were you able to make enough money at that time to, to not only take good care of your new wife, but also save a little to invest for the business? Or how did that, how did that work out? Yes, very reluctantly. Um, I don't think anybody jumps into business and is is rich the next day. I think one of the biggest misconceptions of being self-employed is you're automatically rich. Uh, there is a lot of discipline. Uh, there is a lot of thought process skills. There's a lot of checkers or chess pieces that have to be put in place to make sure everything goes. When you're in business, the easiest thing you do is the job you're doing that day. The hardest thing you do is trying to figure out what you're going to do in three months and start planning for it. And it took me a little while to kind of figure that out. But once we kind of got a system down, yes, the mini excavator was paying for itself. This thing was a good assist to it. But obviously work was coming in more and more and we were quickly outgrowing the fleet of equipment we had. So about the time you get comfortable with the machines you got, you quickly realize you need to make another large investment in your company to keep moving forward. So you're kind of you're kind of just trying to stay a step ahead of that. I had no capital to get started. All I had was skill. You had a lot of skill though. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what kept me going for the longest amount of time was, was I could just, I knew, I knew how to get done what I needed to with what I had. It was what the reality of it was. Uh, looking back now, I, I wonder sometimes like, how did I ever make it? Cause, okay. Because we were, we run pretty thin. I mean, you're you're stretching your neck out there hoping the bet pays off and you're kind of betting on yourself and, and ultimately it has. Uh, I wouldn't change anything, but it's not, I don't want to paint the picture that being self-employed is always sunshine and flowers. It's, it's, there's the good and the bad. Well, in order to do what you're doing now, you really have to have a lot of, of capital tied up, right? I mean, uh, a 755 and a three and a half ton excavator are are are, are not going to cut it for for the variety of tasks that you're doing now, so it's a difficult challenge. It's a capital intensive business, really. Right? It is. There's a lot it, it of is. capital. It is. It is. It's all about overhead management. Okay. All about overhead management. Um, so we we can fast forward here a little bit. This, the the U35 turned into a John Deere 120. That okay. was a, that was a game. So you changer. just kind of traded it. No, I kept them both. I, I okay. added to the fleet. Well, now that you've got a John Deere 120, I can't move that with a pickup truck no more. Right. So now we got a semi truck. Now we got a trailer. Now we got permits. Now we got this. We got that. So did you do that step at the right time? And what would you recommend other folks do? Yeah, the best, uh, the hands down, the best decision I ever made in my excavating business was buying the 120. It got me above the average jail that had a mini excavator. It got me into a whole other class of work. Uh, so now it's very easy to get a pickup truck. It's very easy to get a gooseneck trailer. It's very easy to go obtain a mini excavator. It's not that easy to have a semi and a trailer and the, and the expense of a bigger machine. So that opened my world up to a whole new variety of work. And the most important part, people willing to pay the prices for it because I had less competition. Less competition. So the, the high cost of capital becomes a barrier to entry, I think. Yes, is, uh, it, so it does. It does. Um, and that works in your favor once you have that equipment, right? It does. Now, the flip side of that is I did not go out and buy a brand new machine. I bought a, a very well used machine. Honestly, I still run the machine today. You actually operated it today. Um, a new machine at that time, $110,000, $120,000. I paid $30,000 for this thing. My thought process is behind that. I'm going to be honest with myself. I really don't know if I have work for this. I don't know if this is the machine for the work I have in front of me. I'm not going to take a risk on a machine with a high payment on it where it may or may not be right for my fleet. So I'm going to buy something that I think I need that's affordable 
improve the concept of my jobs. But you also had the asset of the technical skill to be able to repair an older machine. Exactly. Uh, you had a machine that was good enough and new enough that you could get parts for it. Exactly. Um, and you had to spend money, again, on more than just that excavator. You had to get a, a truck and a trailer. Yeah, so between the truck, trailer, and excavator, that was probably about a sixty-five dollars to $70,000 endeavor. And you probably didn't have that at the time. And keep in mind, I paid $50,000 for my house at yeah. the time. That was my mortgage on my house. So yeah, that's uh, that. I know that don't sound like big numbers. And maybe I feel like I'm getting old as I'm talking about in today's standards. But for a 24-year-old 24 24-year-old 24 kid to invest $60,000, $70,000 into not a sure bet, uh, it was a risk. It so was at, a risk. at risk of getting too personal here, and you can you can you can tell me you don't want to answer this, but how did you get the money? How did it, did you have trouble getting the money from? The I bank did or? not have trouble getting the money. Uh, fortunately, I had enough money for a down payment, and I had good credit, so the uh, the banks were more than happy to more than happy to lend me the money. And you had a business that had been going and had proven itself for at yeah. least a little bit of time. Yeah. It's naturally gonna start slow. You you have to have a reputation. So the way I operated in the beginning, and honestly it's pretty similar to the way I still operate today, is if I wanted a John Deere 120, I would get a note for a John Deere 120. I would not buy anything else till that note was paid off. John Deere 120 is paid off, now we need a semi truck. So I'd borrow money for that, now I'd get it paid off. Now we need a trailer, so on and so forth. So I. Within a reason, you gotta have operating capital, but I didn't wanna get drowned in debt because it's rained the last six days here today. I haven't worked in, I haven't worked in six days. Yeah, and if you had a, a monthly payment coming that, that depended on your work, you could, you could default I, in a month. I don't, I, don't, I don't worry about it one bit because uh, I'm sitting pretty comfortable where I'm not, I don't have to work to make a payment because of my overhead position. And I, I can't stress that enough. I see so many companies that go out and they, they spend Three, four hundred thousand dollars in all this new equipment, and I think they know what they need. And come to find out, that's maybe not the right tool for the job. Well, now they're in it upside down, so they can't get rid of it. They gotta, they gotta go on with it. Or it rains for two weeks, and they're they're out there, you know, abusing their equipment in the mud, trying to get something just to get a paycheck to come in. So bite off, bite off increments you can chew. That's my best advice to anybody: is, is start small, prove your concept, work your way up. I was in business for. Almost 12 years before I bought my first, I'm going to air quote it because it was a demo machine, my first new machine. Uh, and by the time I got to where I could buy that new machine, I knew exactly what I needed. And whenever I bought that machine, I knew it would do the exact job I needed to do. You already essentially had jobs lined up to right. pay for it. And right. might not have known the exact job, but you, you had had so many that needed it. But for example, whenever I bought that 120 for $32,000, I was terrified. I bought this other excavator for $100,000 plus. I never lost a minute's sleep because I knew exactly what was coming. You know, I, I knew where it fit into the puzzle. Uh, it was one of the easier decisions I ever made, uh, which is just a complete contrast from the beginning. I hope I'm translating that. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. You, you, you learned a lot and it, your business also grows and, and it becomes more defined. You, you, you know what kind of work you get into. You know that this 120 wasn't accomplishing the goal or maybe it was accomplished on the goal and you need to do more of the same. You, you already know. And, yeah, and the workload was too, the old 120 still running, the workload was too much. So we needed to, we needed to up, update the fleet. It's obviously getting a lot of hours on it and, 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 and catch the rest of the work. So to kind of close that topic, you're not afraid of debt. So it's not like saying avoid debt at all costs. It's just use it carefully. Manage it. Manage it. I, so there's a couple different ways to look at this. I own, give or take, close to 30 pieces of equipment. Um, my newest piece of equipment is a 2017. I got a lot of stuff that's 2014 and older. My theory behind that is, is I can have a whole lot of money in three or four really nice machines, which is going to limit me to this, this category of jobs. I buy really good old machines, have a bigger variety of machines, and my toolbox of what I can do for customers is, is, uh, is, is a lot larger. You, you hate to go to a guy's house and take out a couple of trees and clean a ditch out, and then he wants you to go over here and put a septic in or, or, or brush all the field, and you're like, ah, I can't do that. You're going to have to call Troy down the road or something like that. I just would do as much as I can in the house. So my equipment don't run. I don't get as many hours on it as, as another guy's does. But it don't have to because when it's sitting in the shed, it, it, it's paid for. It's sitting there ready to go. Now the newer stuff that runs on a more hourly basis, yeah, it needs to be 
in good shape and, and, and reliable and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm seeing a couple things. Uh, first, I'm seeing that um, over the years, building up more and more pieces of equipment just gives you the ability to handle more types of jobs. So much more versatile, so much more versatile. And then the other thing I'm seeing is this focus on used equipment. So one of the, one of the perceived negatives of used equipment is repairs. So tell me about what, how that works for you. I okay. mean, it's embarrassing to be on a job and have the equipment quit you. And That's a great question. And I get this question all the time on my YouTube channel because if you guys see my equipment, it's not the prettiest painted stuff. It's not the cleanest cabs. The windshields aren't washed, but I guarantee you one thing. The oil's changed, everything's greased. The, the maintenance is top notch on everything I got. My newest two machines I have, which is a Volvo 140 excavator and a John Deere 850J dozer, have had more downtime this year than all my other machines combined. Your two newest machines have had more downtime than uh, the rest very, of the Very, very well documented. Uh, the John Deere 120 excavator, I've put over 8,000 hours on it. It has 35 hours of unscheduled downtime on the job. 35 hours of unscheduled downtime. The Volvo 140, I have owned, I need to check the numbers to make sure, but I've owned for right at two years, it's at 140 hours of unscheduled downtime. So everything has a life expectancy. Equipment's no different than people. It's gonna run its course. So at some point, you have to make the decision to rebuild that machine or pass that machine on. And if you run it every day, you, you, know, you, know, when it's time to, you know when it's time to cut your losses. The John Deere 120, I made the decision to rebuild it. I, I reinvested almost $25,000 into that machine and, and, and got mm -hmm. it back to where it's supposed to be. Uh, I have an 850B dozer. I don't think I'm gonna reinvest that money. I'm probably gonna pass that machine on down the road to a farmer that puts maybe 20 hours a year on it. Still mm -hmm. make him a great machine, but for me that puts four or 500 hours a year on it, it's not gonna make it another season. Okay. In the late 90s, early 2000s, it was pretty expected for a piece of equipment to run 15, maybe 20,000 hours. Uh, nowadays, manufacturers will tell you 10,000 hours is a life expectancy and probably around 7,000 hours you're gonna start paying for it. So there has been a shift in the industry of the life expectancy of a machine. Probably driven by the technology that it's... And, and the flip side of it is, is you, got, you get less hours out of them and they're twice as more expensive, which goes back to overhead management. So do, does my business warrant new equipment? Absolutely, but not for every piece of equipment I own. It makes perfect is sense. Is the best way I can answer that. Mike, I really appreciate it. I, some of this will not apply to our typical viewer with the, the small equipment. Hopefully we'll have some crossover and some of your viewers can come yeah, catch absolutely. this. But very insightful and very helpful. Uh, just the opportunity to get to know Mike has, has, has been powerful. It's been, it's been a, a, a wonderful relationship so far. And um, Mike does a lot in the entire YouTube community. With a lot of excavation uh, people and other, other YouTube uh, mechanic channels. There's a whole bunch of them that uh, uh, Mike's kind of the organizer, the, the relationship builder. It's been builder. a fun ride. It's it been has fun been ride. fun. So check out Dirt Perfect, fast growing. He'll be, a, he'll be the next million subscriber channel before <laughs> I don't long. know about that, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. It's been a fun ride. YouTube has been an awesome experience. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Tractor, Tractor time, time with Tim. Tim. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes.